The people of God were stuck. For centuries, they lived as slaves to terrifying taskmasters whose cruelty was only exceeded by their power. In these dark days, God's people gave birth to children who would inherit nothing more than misery. Their strongest ally was a god whom they had assumed had forgotten them. Far from forgotten, the people of God were rescued by the might of his hand. He put their masters to open shame and led them into the wilderness. Though they were set free, they weren't yet living free. They started to live as slaves to their own sin. What happened next reverberates for over 3,000 years of history to this current day. Like a loving and patient father, God instructed his children, giving them the Ten Commandments. Exodus, chapter 20 and verse 13, our text tonight. The shortest of all of them, only by two letters, but yet the shortest. If you'll notice, we have the shortest text we'll have throughout this 10-week series, which is exciting for some of you, and not so pleasant for others, because it's more of my own words. It's a joke, sorry. <clears throat> I, I try, I try, I try. Did everybody give in the offering tonight? Did anybody give in the offering tonight? Don't forget... Now is the portion of the service where we'll take the offering. Now that you return to your seats, don't forget. Exodus 20, verse 13. Some of you have already noticed. I haven't read it yet. Thou shalt not kill. Two letters short of thou shalt not steal. Two letters less. It is the shortest of the commandments, number six. And it's the commandment really that seems the furthest removed from us. That's what I noticed right off. Uh, to, to put God in a, in a wrong place, to not keep him number one, to have some form of idol in our lives, uh, to take the name of the Lord in vain, to not keep the Sabbath, to dishonor mothers or fathers, to, to steal, to lie, to covet, to be jealous, all seem like things that could be very applicable to our lives. But right off we get to this one and Thou shalt not kill, it seems a little out of the realm for most of us. I don't think many of us uh, have been involved in cold-blooded murder. I sure hope not. But the facts would suggest otherwise. I, I found this. The average child will watch 8,000 murders on TV before finishing elementary school. This is according to TV Free America. By age 18, the average American has seen 200,000 acts of violence on TV, including 40,000 murders. Moving to a slightly less biased uh, source, the University of Michigan did a similar study in which they found the same 200,000 acts of violence. And in addition to that, at the age of 18, 16,000 murders. We are accustomed to participating in death and killing, and yes, even murder, all the time. We, we are subjected to it constantly. Within our lives, we will witness hundreds of thousands, literally, of acts of violence and tens of thousands of murders before us on the screen. Now, there's always a little bit of, of, a, bit of a, a struggle, a little bit of contention within us when we see the word kill in the King James, and it brings lots of misunderstanding by times, and so we'll define it immediately. From the Hebrew, if we were to translate what the Hebrew word means in those verses, uh, to get our best understanding today, we would use the word murder and not kill. Uh, and that allows us to see the difference between murder and war, self-defense, and defending of one's family, and execution by the state. We see there's a difference between uh, killing and murder. There's some defining line. In the next chapter of Exodus, past our text, verse, or chapter 21 rather, uh, we see a further description 
of murder. We see some of its consequences. We see some of the punishments that take place. We see what it is and what it is not. Exodus 21, verses 12 through 15, we read, He that smiteth the man so that he die shall surely be put to death. You murder somebody, you get executed. And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint a place whither he shall flee. If it's an accidental murder, if it's an accidental death, there's going to be a place of refuge. You can go and you can escape uh, the vigilante justice or the avenging of that person's family. There's a, there's a way of escape. You're not going to be punished by the law, but more than that, there's a place of refuge for you in the Old Testament. But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, thou shalt take him from mine altar that he may die. So here's what, you've murdered somebody, you deserve that penalty, but you've taken your refuge uh, wrongfully, you're going to be dragged from that place of refuge and be executed. The law is going to take place as it should. And he that smiteth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. I believe Alex quoted that last week for us. Exodus 21, 18 to 23, just a few verses later. And if men strive together and one smite another with a stone or with his fist and he die not but keepeth his bed, if he rise again and walk abroad upon his staff, then he that smote him shall be quit. So if somebody almost kills somebody, but they just, they, by the skin of their teeth they live, uh, they're not going to be found guilty of that murder. They're not going to be put to death. Only he shall pay for his loss of time and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. Uh, and so whatever time he's lost, he hasn't been able to work, he hasn't been able to make his wages, that has to be covered. You have to take care of that. But he hasn't killed him fully, even if he intended to, and so the action hasn't been fulfilled, so he's not guilty of the murder. If a man strike a servant or is made with a rod, and he die under his hand, he shall surely be punished. There's punishment for killing your servant. Notwithstanding, if he continue a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his money. So... If the servant happens to live like the other guy by the skin of his teeth, uh, there's really nothing going to happen because his lost wages, his lost time, that was the master's money anyway. The servant was working for the master. The guy hasn't lost anything. There's nothing to be paid in return. Uh, so he just gets to beat him, I suppose. And if men strive, and they hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall surely be punished, according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. So all of this, uh, we see murder and execution. There's a, there's a clear punishment. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, the Old Testament way. You do this to them, this is what you get for it in return. We're going to even everything up. Uh, but this brings us to an important issue. A well-debated, ongoing, gaining attention. Everybody's got an opinion everywhere. Is abortion murder? Exodus 21 and 22 we just read. If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, she miscarries because they've hit her, and yet no mischief follow. She's all right. He shall surely be punished. We see that if mischief does follow, if something happens to her, it's life for life. It's, it's tooth for tooth. It's like any other circumstance. If you kill her, you'll be killed. And this child we see, if the child dies, we see he shall surely be punished. And the punishment is not uh, specifically death here, is what we find. Uh, and I, I think when, when people read and they look at this, uh, the conclusion they come with is it's not the same as killing the mother according to the law, and so there's some kind of, there's some kind of way of escape around this abortion deal, around killing, the killing of the unborn child. Um, but I'd like to put that to a small example, if you'll allow me. And I'm going to jump to the Eighth Commandment, the second of the shortest, Thou shalt not steal. Uh, and I'd like, to, I'd like to, to, you just to imagine with me for a minute. Everybody going to, going to imagine with me in your minds? Okay, I go to Walmart, and, uh, you know, I need, I need a new T-shirt from Walmart, but I don't have any money. I left my wallet at home. 
and it was empty anyway. That's why I left it there. So I go and pick up. It's 20 bucks for the t-shirt, and I try to slip out of Walmart. I've now stolen from Walmart. You know what they're going to do to me? They're going to take the t-shirt, and they're going to say, get out. Don't ever come back. You're banned from Walmart. If you come back again, we're going to call the police, but you're, you're done, like, at least for a year. You're, you're gone. You're out of Walmart. Don't shop here. We don't like you. We don't want you. We got your picture hanging on the wall next to the greeter, who's like 90 years old and has like glasses this thick. So he's gonna, know, he's gonna recognize you right off. And you're banned from Walmart. But what happens if I do the same thing, but this time instead of going to, to Walmart for a $20 t-shirt, how about I go to CIBC, my local branch, and instead of just making a withdrawal from my checkings account, I say, how about you just give me all of your money? Right? Breaking the same command, right? At gunpoint. At gunpoint. Give me all your money. The result is going to be vastly different, correct? Can anybody say yes? Yes. yes. The, the, the outcome is going to be vastly different from me stealing a $20 t-shirt at Walmart and me going and sticking up CIBC. Okay? What happens to me is going to be different. Although I broke the same command in God's eyes... I am still a thief. I've stolen. I've broken the eighth commandment. I'm guilty of punishment. And so bringing it back, looking at this, there is a different punishment between the death of the mother and the death of the unborn child. The, the, the death of the unborn child is decided between the husband, the father of that child, and the judges to determine what should this person pay. And when it comes to the wife, it's very clear, it's life for life. Whatever happens to her, that's what happens to this other person. But there is punishment involved because the law is broken. Earlier when we saw that there was an accidental death, there's no punishment involved because the law is not broken. It's not against God's law to accidentally kill somebody. There was no punishment involved. There was, in fact, there was a place of refuge. But when we find the death of an unborn child, what we see is there's punishment involved. Though it's not necessarily the same punishment as every other instance, it's different with servants, it's different with, with the women, and it's different with, uh, with, with these brothers, it's different with your father and your mother compared to just anybody on the street. The Bible defines different punishments for different people, but if there's a punishment involved, it's because the law is broken. Abortion in the scripture is very clearly murder. Now Mark Driscoll made this great point, and uh, when, I, when I was uh, listening to what he had to say about this, this really struck me, and I've seen it uh, portrayed in, uh, across the news and in other, in other, um, other ways that would lead me to believe that what he said is exactly right. Imagine that a man does just what happened in the Bible, but it's intentional. It's not just striving with another man and they hit somebody or they hit a pregnant lady and she's caused to miscarriage, but instead, it's more heinous than that. The man simply comes and, and hits her in the belly and causes her to, to have a miscarriage. Society would be outraged. It'd be heinous. They'd be painted as a terrible murderer, an awful person. They would be hated. They'd be plagued. They'd be all over the news. And rightfully so. What an evil, awful horrible, heinous crime. And that's the view that all of society would have unless that man is a doctor and that woman asked him to do it. There's no excuse given in Scripture. There's no excuse we can find in our hearts and or in our minds in the Word of God that would allow for anybody to abort a child and say that that is not murder. Regardless of the cause for the abortion, regardless of the cause of the pregnancy, there's no excuse. One of the greatest things, this is what I, I find so incredible about this, this mindset that it's, it's something that's helpful, it's something that, that is, that is that's not murder. That it's not murder. It's, it's incredible to me that somebody could get to this place in their mind that they would think that it's women's rights to have an abortion. This one thing changes that. 
this one thing would have to change that if you were ever of the persuasion that it's women's rights, consider this. Half of all abortions are to kill women. Literally, it's mothers killing daughters. What does that do for women's rights, for a mother to kill her own daughter? Just consider that. To leave that, that's a bit, that's a bit heavy, but it's important in a society like this that we understand and we have a firm grasp of the fact that that's wrong. We understand that we can stand on the word of God. And if we do stand on the word of God, we can only stand against abortion. It's the only place to stand if you're on the word of God. We have to be able to defend that. We have to believe in that. Amen? Amen. So another pressing question that I have, and I promise I'm not going to be long tonight. What is wrong with murder anyway? Why is murder wrong? What is wrong with murder? What, what is it that makes murder such an awful thing? When we begin to think about it, and we think that murder is one of the most heinous, awful things, that, even out of all the commandments, we see murder as something that's so far removed from us. What is it with murder that is so wrong? If we consider that in creation, on that sixth day when God began to make man, the crowning jewel of all of his creation, he stooped down, he took the dust from the earth, and he began to form it. And then when he breathed into it, he breathed in the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Man became eternal, just like God and all of his angels. Man was separated from all of creation. Man was uniquely different from every other thing that God had ever created. It was not simply, we were not simply spoken into existence, but we were created by his hands. And more importantly than that, when God began to create us and he began to form us, he looked forward in John 1 and 1 we read that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. There was a plan in his mind. There was an expression of God's thought for the future. And we read in that in verse 14 and it's familiar to us that the word became flesh. At that point in Bethlehem when Jesus was born, many generations into men living on the earth but God looked forward to that moment in the creation. He looked forward to the second Adam when he created the first Adam. And he said, let us make man in our image. He looked forward to what he would look like, what he would be like when he walked on this earth as the man Jesus Christ. And he formed Adam. He formed you and I in the likeness of that image, the image of the invisible God. Not only do we have the breath of God in us, but we have the likeness and the image of God on each one of us. And so to kill, to destroy without reason, without purpose, to murder the image of God, that's what makes murder so incredible. That's what makes murder so wrong, so evil. That's why we cringe at the thought of somebody dying without cause. There's something that's within us that we understand the defiling the image of God like that is so incredibly wrong. But Jesus steps in when he does come and when that form of God is manifest on the earth, finally, that image of God is here for real. Jesus decides he's going to take the scripture one step further and give light to us. Matthew 5, 21 and 22. Ye have heard that it was said of them in old time, Here's Exodus 20, 13. Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Verse 21 sums up Exodus 20 and 13 perfectly. That's what, we, that's what we see in the Old Testament. Verse 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Let's take it back to verse 21. Just to make sure we're, we're clear on this. Can we get back to... Uh, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Verse 22. Whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. It's the same thing. It's likened exactly 
Whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. One and the same. Parallel. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. When that anger is within you, when that hatred is within you, and you begin to spew out language against your brother out of anger, and you say, Raka, that you're in danger of counsel. When you begin to call people names, you're in danger of the counsel. But when you take it too far, and you say, Thou fool, when you take that, those angry feelings and you let them build and you let it get to a point that's too far, you're in danger of hellfire. When you don't take care of it, you're no longer just in danger of the council, but you're in danger, literally, of hellfire. And I'll have the music come back already. Unjust anger, it's likened to murder, very clearly. Hate harbored, it's a murderous heart. It's a hating heart, it's an evil heart. We see that in the Old Testament, men's actions are judged by the letter of the law. If you kill, you, you've done this. If you, men's actions are judged by the letter of the law. But in the New Testament, the word is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And God looks at more than just what we've done, but he looks at what's within us that's caused us to do those things. He looks at what's in our hearts and he sees us for who we are and he sees the anger and the hatred that's within us. Here's the crux of the message. It's not only wrong to kill the likeness and the image of God, but it is a sin to hate the likeness and the image of God. What God has put inside of you is his life, his breath, eternity. You have the opportunity to be with God forever and ever and ever. You hold the image of God, what he planned on looking like from the beginning. Jesus Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before time began, God had a plan, God had a thought, in his mind of how he would save us what he would look like who he would be and when he thought of the man Jesus Christ that would come and would redeem his beloved creation that's the image he was thinking of when he created you and I that's the bodies he was thinking of when he created you and I that's the image of God that he had in his mind he was thinking of that second Adam Jesus when he created the first Adam and then when he created every other person after that. And so to hate the likeness and the image of God is just as wrong and just as sinful and just as much a crime against God himself, not just the person you're hating, God himself. It's such a crime against God to hate his very image. And it's summed up like this. 1 John 4 and 20. If you haven't heard anything else I've said, I would encourage you, listen to this. If a man say, I love God, and he hateth his brother, he is a liar. He's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? In other words, you haven't seen Jesus. You weren't here at the time when he walked the earth. And you haven't seen the one sitting on the throne. You haven't seen the glorified body of Jesus, which encompasses everything that he was from the beginning of time. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all in one in the body of Jesus glorified, sitting on the throne in heaven with angels surrounding him, crying, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. You haven't seen that one. How can you say you love that one when you don't love the closest thing you have to him? The image of your brother, the image of God. 
if you don't love the person that's sitting next to you, who is the closest thing you have seen to seeing God himself, how can you say that you love the fullness of the image of God? You cannot. The Bible says you're a liar. I already said I don't think most of us, any of us, are cold-blooded killers. I don't think we've done the action in the Old Testament of murdering somebody. I don't think we're in need of a public execution tonight. It would be foolish for me to think that we would. On the issue of abortion, I think for most of us, if not all of us, it's something that we need to know to combat the ways of society. It perhaps doesn't apply even to anybody in this room specifically. But this I know. Somebody needs to hear that if you say you love God and you hate your brother, you're a liar. Somebody needs to hear that tonight. We may not be cold-blooded killers, but some of us, no doubt, have hatred in our heart for our brother. There's somebody here, you have ill feelings towards somebody. You have bad feelings. You, you are hating the image of God that you see and that you walk with and that you're supposed to be living for God with. You probably haven't said Raka to them, but you might have called them an idiot. Maybe you didn't say thou fool, but you know you've gone too far. And I don't say, but the word of God says, you're in danger of hellfire if you say thou fool. I wonder if in a moment of sincerity, in a moment of honesty, in a moment with open hearts to the word of God, if you would join me in these altars. If everybody comes, if every person in this room would come, then perhaps it's only one or two, but the one or two people that are harboring hatred in their heart and they know when they hear this word that they hate somebody right now and they need to let it go. They need to talk to God about it. They need to talk to that person about it. If everybody comes, what an opportunity you would have created for those people who need it the most. So I ask you if you would come to this altar right now. And the singers would join us on the platform. in your heart but why don't you wait on the Lord for some understanding why don't you wait on the Lord to talk to you about those ill feelings that you've had and when you know that you've gone too far and you said the wrong thing and you've lashed out in anger and you didn't realize until tonight that you've murdered somebody in your own heart 